Hi, I'm Dr. Ernie Ward, a veterinarian from the United States, and I'd like to thank you for your interest in the ethics of how we feed our pets. Uh, this has been a journey of self-discovery for over 31 years in my case, and I've become increasingly concerned about the impacts that pet food has on our environment, on the welfare of animals, and certainly on humanity. And so today we're going to talk a little bit around the ethics of how we feed our pets. And, and I hope that this conversation will, will spark you to make further discoveries and maybe inquiries and hopefully to initiate change. Um, again, you can reach me at a variety of places. One of the things that we've been working on hard in the United States for the past two years is an organization I co-founded called Veterinarians Against Ventilation Shutdown, which we'll talk about later, which is, uh, you know, quite frankly, a very inhumane method of killing animals. So let's talk about this. And, and the terminology that I use in uh, my latest book, The Clean Pet Food Revolution, is called ethical feeding friction. And let's discuss what that means. Basically, there is an increasing gap between how people perceive the food that they feed and eat themselves and what they might feed a dog or a cat or a companion animal. And this friction is set up whenever a person starts to make very, you know, very conscious choices about what they choose to eat themselves. They choose organic, non-GMO, humanely raised, maybe they're vegan or vegetarian. So they're making these choices for themselves but many pet parents, many individuals around the world have not given any consideration to what goes into their pet food bowl or feeding their whatever animal. And so I think that that's really the friction that we're starting now to witness. And so people are starting to say, wait a second, this, these choices I'm making for how I feed my animals aren't aligning with the choices I feed my family, so what can we do? And as this friction increases, this is where we see turbulence, this is where we see controversy, this is where we see hopefully change initiated for sure. Now, again, where I land on this is the, the real divide is between people that love pets. They are self-professed dog moms, cat dads, and things like that, but yet they ignore livestock suffering. And you can see this, this really is hip, hypocritical, right? Because on one hand, they show and shower admiration and affection and care and concern and pass laws to protect a certain set of species while completely ignoring and advocating and allowing for the suffering of millions or if not billions of others for sure. And that's why I say it's time that we radically reevaluate how we feed our pets. Now, this is only one part of a much larger story and a much larger change that is necessary if we're going to save our planet. Now, I think that for veterinarians, you know, we have to sort of choose, well, what's the greatest impact I can have maybe on the world? As a veterinarian, I can't really solve the energy crisis. I'm not good at feeding humans. But what I can do is challenge our industry to change, perhaps, and improve how we feed our pets. And I would encourage you to do the same for sure. Now, I'd also like to point out that this is a global dilemma, right? This isn't something that's only in industrialized nations. This isn't something that's only in wealthy nations like the US or the UK. This impacts Brazil, this impacts South America, Asia, everywhere, right? Because this this global network of, of food companies, pet food companies, really, you know, is influencing how we feed pets in India, for example, and in and, and Canada. So for me, this is not an issue that's just confined to the borders of one country or even my own country. And again, I think that as we understand how the global industry works, we start to realize, wow, the way things that are happening in Thailand do influence the way we choose pet foods in the United States. And we'll talk about this in detail here in just a minute. And again, you know, we only have a brief period of time to spend with you today, but my goal here is to get you to think differently about how we feed our pets. Now, we know that current estimates are that Americans will spend about $50 billion uh, in 2022 feeding their pets, okay? And, and depending on whose estimates you look at, you know, there's maybe 150 or more uh, dogs and cats, and of course, there's uh, associated other companion animal species. Now, 
The bad news is that the pet food industry is now one of the major contributors to global meat production. In fact, we're going to give you some startling statistics uh, that I talk about in my book, The Clean Pet Food Revolution. And one of the things that we talk about here is, again, when we are starting to shift dogs and cats to high meat, human-grade foods, then, of course, that puts more demand on producers to produce more poultry, more beef, more pork, more whatever. And of course, that just intensifies the pressure to factory farming, which is really, I think, something that most of us as veterinary professionals should have grave concerns about for sure. Now, when we look at some of the latest estimates, pets in the United States eat about 30% of all the meat produced. Now, I want to give you a second just to process that. Nearly a third of all of the meat produced consumed in the United States is going to feed dogs and cats. So this is now no longer an insignificant contributor, right? I think at one time we could have made the argument, well, it's just byproducts. These are the things that people wouldn't have eaten otherwise, so it's going to good use. And I don't have a strong argument against that. But what we've seen now is this dramatic shift towards using whole animals and human-grade cuts. I mean, that seems to be the biggest trend in the United States and UK right now. And so we're now using the good parts, if you will, not the byproducts of animals, to feed dogs and cats. Again, just accelerating and, and really expanding the need for animal proteins for sure. Now, if you looked at this in terms of, of humanity, uh, the dogs and cats in the U.S. would be the fifth largest country in terms of meat consumption. And again, just kind of let that sink in for just a second, because if I look at, you know, wow, dogs and cats in the U.S., rank them, you know, behind like the U.S., Brazil, you know, Russia. Wow, that's pretty significant. I'd also like to point out that we know that that they're contributing a lot to greenhouse gases. And so dog and cat food consumption is estimated to be responsible for 64 million metric tons of CO2 every year. And again, these are from, you know, some pretty well-respected research papers. And again, we all know they're only estimates. That means that you can have people that would disagree with it, but it says a bigger story. There's a big contribution. Now, hopefully you've seen documentaries like Cowspiracy and others that sort of go into details on how intensive that meat production, beef production in particular, is on resources, natural resources, water, arable lands, right? I mean, these are, these are things that really, really do concern us, you know, uh, and waste for sure. So if you're not familiar with some of these documentaries, I encourage you to look at it. And of course, there are critics that, that say, oh, they cherry pick certain data or we can, can scrutinize certain uh, data points. But having said that, I'm saying just look at the larger trend here. We know there's tremendous use of natural resources that could be, you know, going to humans for sure. Okay, so I also want to point out the fact that marketing plays a big role in how we perceive pet food. So if we're looking at the ethical feeding friction, we have to say, well, why, why do people feed the way they feed in the first place? And that's largely driven by narratives orchestrated by large corporations through the media. And so this is an example here of a very popular television ad in the United States that depicts dogs as wolves. And so there has been a very, very con concentrated effort over the past 15 years to align dogs, chihuahuas, shih tzus, Pomeranians, with the wolf. And we know, of course, that these are completely different species. I mean, we've co-evolved with dogs now for 35 to 55 million years, or 1,000 years, rather, sorry. So we know that millions of years of differences in evolution and biology between wolves and dogs exist. And so this narrative, again, promotes the idea that higher meat, higher animal meat consumption is necessary for a healthy dog. So that's one important aspect, and that's one of the reasons why many veterinarians also have the beliefs that they have because we also have been overwhelmed by messages from companies telling us that animal meats are the preferred and biologically preferred protein source, which again, remember, this is all about nutrients, not ingredients. Your body doesn't care where that amino acid originated as long as it gets that amino acid. And so this is why, again, plant-based and even lab-grown meats in the future are going to satisfy those nutritional demands because, again, nutrients, not ingredients. Now, there's another fairy tale that's being 
propagated out there, and that is that the family farm is how we get our food, right? So they use ads like this to depict that, oh my gosh, you know, this is amazing. Family farms are the benchmark, the, the foundation of our culture and so forth. And these people are genuinely concerned about the animals that they care for, and they produce high quality products. And so again, many, many consumers around the world think that, well, the milk that I'm drinking this morning with my breakfast actually came from a family farm, much like depicted in this picture. Well, the reality is this. I mean, this is modern dairy farming right here. And so when, when we start to, to look at the reality of what farming really looks like, you know, people don't like it when we uncover that. But you and I as veterinary professionals know this is the reality that we're dealing with, right? I mean, these are gestation crates that are used commonly or predominantly throughout the United States and in China. And so, you know, most of the pork that, that we eat, <laughs> you know, is coming from these types of, of, of scenarios. And so, again, I think that it's very important for us as veterinary professionals to recognize the truth of how the animals are cared for that humans are consuming around the world. And so I think we can do better. And I think that we as veterinarians must be the voice for these voiceless animals. Because again, as long as these types of images exist and these practices are condoned and legally allowed, then you know, we have, uh, we have a, a, a problem. And so that's one of the reasons that I, you know, was moved a few years ago when ventilation shutdown really became the most common way to depopulate large numbers of animals, and particularly pork or pigs and chickens. And this occurred for us in the United States during the early days of COVID, and we had all these different problems with getting workers and so forth, and there was a backlog uh, in pork production facilities, and so they began to literally turn you know, on the heaters, close down the windows and turn off the ventilation, and these animals were dying by hyperthermia. So if you want to learn it more, definitely check out the organization BAVSD.org. Uh, we've been working uh, politically and within the American Veterinary Medical Association to try to get them to at least say this practice is not recommended because currently it is, and we think that it puts our profession in a very poor light when it comes to animal welfare and as stewards of good health. So I think that, you know, for me as a veterinarian, I'm still sort of perplexed why so many veterinarians are quick to defend a practice like this without fully understanding the scope and scale, because this is being used to kill tens of millions of animals right now in the United States and, and elsewhere. And so for me, it's, it's something that as a veterinarian, we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we upholding our oath to alleviate animal suffering? And I can't, we aren't, we aren't in this case. So again, ventilation shutdown is just one of many, many issues. And, and again, I guess today in this very brief presentation, I'd like for you to find that one passion point for you. Like what is it that you think you can maybe make change? Like for example, in the United States, this is something I've been very outspoken about. You know, we've, we've, made major national initiatives to try to get this change. I mean, we've been unsuccessful, but we have pushed this conversation to the forefront of veterinarians. And now many veterinarians are familiar with this. And I think that change, while I wish it would happen overnight, and it needs to desperately for the welfare of these animals, uh, it sometimes takes time. So we're, we're still continuing to work on that. Uh, also, you know, when you look at the impact of, of all of these feeding practices and the myth, you know, we, we need to make sure that we also understand that we're depleting you know, the, the Earth's megafauna, right? And so whether it's in the, on the sea or the land, these intensive harvesting practices are really disrupting our fragile ecosystem. And again, you know, Seaspiracy is another one of those documentaries, like Cowspiracy, that, you know, critics can say they can nitpick numbers, but it's the trend, right? The trend is clear. The trend is that we are depleting our natural resources, driving climate change, and literally leading to the extinction of millions of species around the globe, including the threat to humanity. So I think that, you know, when I, I see these critics, and they say, oh, well, they said it was X percentage and it was really was X minus two percentage. I'm like, that's not the point. <laughs> you know, like, so we die in 10 years as opposed to, you know, 
eight. I mean, this is something we have to get a little more serious about. Um, I really, you know, Ripple's paper uh, also was one of those uh, papers that hit me like a ton of bricks uh, when it was published in 2019. So he and a team of researchers said, wait a second, are we actually harvesting, you know, raising, cultivating animals for human consumption? the vast majority of animals on the planet, are we actually driving them to extinction? So what he did was they took some uh, very uh, elegant uh, modeling and, and took all the data available, and they said, okay, what are the current threats? And of course, the biggest threat across all types of species, land, air, you know, reptiles, sea, was harvesting. And then why were they being harvested? Well, they were being harvested for meat production. So if you're not familiar with Ripple's paper, I definitely encourage you to look at it. I think that this paper in particular is just one of those landmark uh, benchmark types of research papers that will get you thinking for sure. Because when you start to realize, wow, humanity's, you know, vast appetite for meat is what's really threatening our entire planet's survival, then, you know, it hopefully will move you to change. And even if you just change your own daily habits, right? Even if you only say, I'm, I'm going to stop eating animal meats. I mean, that's, that's a step. That is progress. That's moving forward. And, and I can tell you, as someone you know, who hasn't, who's been plant-based, who hasn't eaten any animals, you know, for, for 36 years now or so, uh, a, you can survive, you can thrive, but B, you know, you become more educated and you start to share your story with others and you have influences in places you can't imagine for sure. So I'd like to, you know, now kind of shift slightly, you know, we need to understand that the international pet food industry is now one of the major contributors to global meat production, which leads to a direct expansion of factory farming, environmental destruction, and even things like human slavery. And I think a lot of times people forget about the impacts on humans that are forced literally to raise the, the meats that we feed our animals. And, and in 2015, there was a, an amazing expose done by the New York Times that actually proved and led to some change, which we'll talk about in just a second, how slavery, indentured servitude was being practiced, uh, in, especially in Thailand, uh, from fishermen. And so this, this, these, uh, these fishes were being used for cat food primarily in the United States, and I think that this really you know, shook a lot of people. Nestle uh, Purina wound up you know, saying you know, publicly, okay, we know that this is a, a big deal. Um, meanwhile, they were being assaulted with multiple types of cases, including a child labor lawsuit. Uh, so, you know, in Africa. So for us, we know that that expose forced a large corporation, a pet food company, to actually look at how they were they were producing the foods and, and change for sure. Um, there's actually, I mean, it's so bad that there are websites devoted to saying, can you look at the company, you know, the products and see, you know, if they're involved in human trafficking or even slavery. So, you know, I, th I think that that's one of those elements that when I started lecturing on this uh, shortly after the New York time, I would drop this in my lectures in the United States and, you know, veterinarians would become very uncomfortable, right? <laughs> they're like, how dare you, you know, but the truth hurts. And this is one of those areas where we as a profession need to critically evaluate and say, wait a second, the choices that I'm making, the products that I'm promoting, you know, are they actually in the best interest of, of humanity, of animal welfare, and so forth? And I think that's a really, really important thing to note. Now, we know clearly that there are tremendous advantages to feeding a plant-based or even in the future lab-grown meat diets. And so we know that you know we're going to use much less water. We know that we're going to use require much less land. We know that we're going to contribute much less to greenhouse emissions, and it takes a lot less energy. I mean, I think now we're kind of in this area where the arguments are, well, is this 99% less or is it 89% less? And again, I would encourage you to say, it doesn't matter. It's tremendously less resource intensive. And I think for me as a veterinarian, I'm starting to use this as part of the levers that I pull with veterinarians and pet parents to say, you know, look, let's take a look at, at water consumption. Like right now in the United States, many parts of our country is experiencing severe drought. So this is another way to say, okay, you know, if we're looking at water conservation, this might be a choice to go to a plant-based pet food uh, for your dog or your cat for sure. And I think, you know, as we move into the future, when we get into really lab-grown meats, 
I think this is where we're going to see even more tremendous advantages and benefits. And we're not there yet. I mean, this is just now coming online. I mean, we're seeing countries like Singapore really accelerate uh, their efforts uh, from a national standpoint. I mean, the government is getting behind that, and we're seeing this around the world. But I think that what you'll find is over the next 10 years, these types of solutions are going to come much more common and accessible and affordable, and that's really going to change the game. And of course, there's going to be lots of hiccups and controversies controversies around uh, these products as they emerge into the marketplace. They are a tremendous threat to multi-billion dollar international companies. So you can bet they're not going to just take it lightly. But we also know that this is the only way we're going to actually survive as a, as a species for sure. Now, if you also look at the number of companies that are in this space, you realize that innovation is happening quickly. And this is just one of the latest you know examples of, of some of the companies. And this is something called the New Protein Landscape. You can go and visit online. They constantly are updating this. But these are, you know, I remember when we first started talking about this around 2015, 2016, this this slide, you know, was was not so crowded. It, there were there were very few companies, you know, there was maybe 40 or 50 companies around the world looking at this. And now, of course, it's gotten so massive and overwhelming that it's hard to figure out what it is. And, you know, if you kind of pay attention, there's really only a handful of companies, uh, you know, doing this sort of lab grown, you know, types of proteins uh, in the pet food space. And honestly, uh, only one of them actually has a product that's 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 working. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, we want to watch this space closely. But you realize that all of this other stuff is slowly impacting. And where it's really impacting pet parents and veterinarians is the fact that these products are becoming available. People are talking about them in the media. And so when I look at lists like this, I go, wow, you know, this is forwarding a conversation. This is sparking change. And so, you know, again, when people can go to a grocery store in the United States or in Brazil or in the UK, and suddenly they can look down the grocery aisle and they can see hamburger patties that are made from plant-based proteins, I'm going, wow, this is amazing, right? Because suddenly now that consumer who's not a vegetarian or vegan, who doesn't care about animal welfare, who dismisses climate change as something that doesn't affect them, they suddenly now have an, an alternative. And if it's cheaper, maybe they buy it. If somebody says it tastes really good, maybe they try it. Maybe they try it just for the novelty. But that's the entryway, right? We have to provide pathways and gateways for people to initiate change. And again, that's where plant-based pet foods also play a role uh, in our choices for sure. Now, why isn't this happening though, right? I mean, what, so, okay, Ernie, you've made a compelling case. I get it. Less resource intensive, no ethical dilemmas. Morally, it seems better for sure. So why is that? And that's a ter this is due to a term I call ingredient bias. There is an intrinsic bias that's been built up generations, right? Maybe even evolutionarily for a preference of animal-based proteins. Why? Because that's all humanity ever knew. Think about that for a second. We have inherent biases against things we're unfamiliar with, and that's really a protective mechanism, right? So, I mean, when we look at all the cognitive biases that we have, almost all of them are distilled into one simple thing, to protect you from harm. And so when something new comes along, your instinct is to say, wait a second, there must be a catch. There must be a harm here for sure. And I think that what I'm trying to get people to do is just be more mindful of the choices they make when they're feeding their animals. And so as a veterinarian, you know, what can you do today? I would say that the first thing that's that's really important to, to note is the fact that you need to educate yourself. There are a vast variety of research publications out there that have evaluated the validity, legitimacy, safety of plant-based proteins right for animals. And, and we can argue about these, these studies, who are they funded by or whatever, but the reality is we're starting to now see a mounting body of evidence that says, hey, it's nutrients, not ingredients. And that's one of the things I've really hammered home in all of my books all of these years is the fact that when we look at nutrition as a whole, we really have to get away from ingredient bias and get down to nutrients, right? So when you're looking at for example, what you should feed the, the dog or the cat, you really want to look at amino acids, right? And, and this is where I think that we, as a profession, have got to make that jump. We have to under, have this leap of understanding that, okay, this really isn't about beef, 
or pork or lamb or pea proteins or even a lab-grown mouse, right? This is about the amino acid profile. How does that match up with what the nutritional requirements are for that species? And I think once we start to transcend into that area, we start to open our minds and we start to say, okay, I can now overcome the ingredient bias because it's nutrients, not ingredients, right? And so now I'm able to say, what's best for you and forget if it came from a plant or an animal source, it's the nutrients. So I think that's the first step. The second step that we need to do is really begin to investigate, you know, these companies that we are getting behind. And so I think that it's important for us as veterinarians to to do some research and to look at the news and not just sort of dismiss that as outside of our profession. And again, I would just say be mindful of the choices that we're making. So I want us to move into this ethical feeding realm. You know, and many people call, you know, people like us ethical vegans, right? And we're doing it not just for the health reasons or climate change, but we're doing it because it's the best for animal welfare. And, and it, I, would, I would broaden that, the, that definition. And whatever your motivation is, I would say let your principles, right? Let your personal values guide your food choices that you recommend to your clients. So if I'm you today, there are a some, few simple questions that I want you to ask. Number one, is that food nutritionally complete? And again, you can match up animal proteins versus plant-based or even the future of lab-grown. But is it nutritionally complete, right? And this is why I'll always say nutrients, not ingredients, right? This is the key. So is it nutritionally complete? Looking at the amino acids, maybe even a refresher course in, in physiology if you need that. You know, so how does the body utilize these proteins? Number one. Number two, is it manufactured as safely as possible? Right. So is, is this product being produced safe? That means free of contamination. One of the things that concerns me are some of the, the drugs that are showing up in pet foods uh, around the world, you know, that are just due to contamination. And this can be, you know, things such as uh, euthanasia solution or microplastics. But is the food being produced as safe as possible? And I think that when you start to re realize that many, many toxins and, and contaminants are concentrated. So again, the, the more they're being fed to that cow, right? Or that chicken, they're going to be concentrated in those muscular skeletal mus muscular tissues. So that means they're going to be amplified in whoever ingests that. So when you start to look at plants, that's where they have a huge advantage. I mean, obviously processing and, and basic food safety is, is a, you know, for across all types of, of foods and ingredients. Having said that, we know that plant-based uh, proteins typically have a higher safety profile. What about environmental impacts, right? I mean, we talked about that chart of using, you know, how, how plant-based proteins can use up to 99% less water maybe than, than beef. So what about the environmental impacts of the pet foods that you're recommending? I think that needs to be at the front of your mind. I, I really, when you start to ask that question, that starts to change your choices for sure. What about suffering? We've made the case today that, you know, obviously there's some I believe some very objectionable, inhumane practices on animal welfare front, right? I think that there are, are cows and pigs and chickens and fish that are just really under the most horrific conditions. And I think that's wrong. And I think that should be part of our questions, right? That we ask before we make a recommendation. But also don't forget that there may be humans that are affected as well. And I think that in 2015, that was really, you know, the bellwether for us. It was like, okay, we need to start to now look at this uh, from a human, you know, suffering perspective as well. And then finally, do you have a better choice? Right. So before you make that recommendation that you've always made for the last 10 years or five years or 30 years uh, in your veterinary practice, are there better choices? And I think that sometimes if we just take one pause, a step back and say, you know, I'd like to investigate what else is out there. You know, I haven't really gone back and reviewed what's available in the marketplace. I think that you'll find very quickly that, oh, wow, things have changed. And I, I know that many veterinarians just like to, to rely on that one little quick you know, recommendation. Well, one, two, three, right? Because <laughs> that's what you've known. But I would also say broaden that a bit. And you might be able to add a four or a five to your choices. And some of those just might be a plant-based protein. Because ultimately, we're trying to get rid of, you know, these, uh, these, um, these ethical frictions. Um, the other thing is, if we don't solve this, I don't know how we feed the planet. It's just that simple. 
You're seeing more and more, you know, projections showing that we're going to hit 9, 10 billion humans uh, over the next few years, and we just don't have the resources to feed them all. And even if we could feed them all, the expense to climate is going to be exorbitant, and that means that we are now in real peril for sure. So again, I encourage you to check out VAVSD.org if you'd like to learn more about ventilation shutdown and just some of the things that that I'm certainly passionate about. Uh, Website, you know, all these things I work with, uh, podcasts, just definitely check it out. But as I said at the beginning, I want to just thank you so much for your interest in this topic. Uh, These are not comfortable topics for veterinarians. These are many times topics that veterinarians say, I have no business even thinking about. I can't have any impact on. And I strongly disagree. Each of us make daily choices. Each of us have actions and habits that can either make the world a little better or not. And I encourage you just to maybe sit back, think about the ethical friction of pet food today, and say, am I making the best choices I can for me, my pet patients, and the planet? I'm Dr. Ernie Ward. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Talk to you soon. Bye.